we're thrilled that you can join us for an overview of the work that our library is doing um, and has been doing to address critical issues guiding how and whether we can provide online access to our collections, particularly for special collections. We're excited to discuss these processes and policies with you because what we've developed is adoptable and adaptable by other institutions. So this can enable not just our, our library, but also any other interested US cultural heritage institution to move forward in understanding how to provide responsible online access to special collections materials. We, will, we are recording uh, the webinar today, and we will also be providing you with all of our slides and transcripts um, to everyone who registered and, and to the entire library staff. So there's no need to take any notes or, or screenshot the slides. Um, and we're gonna be making the recording available on the Skullcom YouTube site, along with our other videos on similar topics in which you might be interested. However, we will not be recording the question and answer session at the end of today so that we can encourage open discussion. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize and respect, respectfully acknowledge that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo Ohlone. So I want to um, quickly distinguish what today's presentation is not. Um, we are not talking today about digitizing books for interlibrary loan or course fee reserves or whether we can make a full scan of any particular item to provide to a patron. We are not talking today about book scanning for Google Books or HathiTrust or the conditions under which HathiTrust can make our books available to one patron at a time under the controlled digital lending theory. So if you came here with questions about scanning all or portions of books to provide to patrons or what HathiTrust is doing, you can send those questions to the scholarly communications team or SALWA, and we'd be glad to explain both the law and library policies behind all of that. Today, what we're instead talking about is digitizing our collections at scale and making them publicly available online through our fairly newly launched digital collections site as part of the library's digital lifecycle program, or DLP. And to tell you more about what DLP is, I'm going to turn things over briefly to SALWA. Great. Thanks, Rachel. So the Digital Lifecycle Program, DLP, helps the library improve and expand scholars' access and use of the resources by creating, publishing online, and preserving our digital collections through the widespread digitization and by providing complementary digital services and initiatives around the materials we digitize. Um, in September 2018, after an extensive year-long review and evaluation of different digital collection platforms, the library selected Tinned Digital Archive, Tinned DA, to manage its extensive digital collections. And over the past year, Library IT, working along with many of our colleagues across different libraries, has migrated over 300 digital collections, which includes over tens of thousands of records and files, from various different sources and systems into our new digital collections platform. And as we continue to migrate the last of our digital collections from the existing platforms, so we can, continue, we can complete our consolidation into this one digital collections platform. Um, the library's digital collections portal provides us with a complete solution for storing, organizing, finding, retrieving, and preserving and sharing our digital files. And this platform also integrates the IIIF compliant viewer, which is the international image interoperability framework, uh, which allows for greater manipulation of our image assets. So the public launch of Digital Collections Portal made it easy for our users to search and browse the digital collections from Berkeley's many libraries, from our Bancroft um, Library to East Asian EAL Library, to our subject libraries, collections that come from across all the libraries um, are hosted in our digital collections platform. And this helped us open up the library's treasured collections to the world to enable open scholarship, which is a key strategic goal for the DLP program. And over the next few years, we're hoping to dedicate more resources to allow for expanded forms of scholarship um, using our digital assets, which will allow new possibilities for open scholarship. So the 
ELP work that you'll be hearing about today emanates from two working groups charged by the Digital Lifecycle Program Steering Committee. The rights workflow you'll hear about today were developed before I started uh, by a group that was charged with developing the law and policy workflows and a takedown policy which governs collection digitization decisions. The work of that group resulted in the creation of more work and more groups, of course. Um, and then this past year, the DLP Steering Committee has been working on charging various groups that would help us implement the law and policy workflows, including charging a group with developing a set of local best practices for ethics workflow in particular. And our hope is to be able to apply these workflows as new collections get proposed for digitization and for publishing online. And now back over to Rachel to discuss these issues and workflows in greater detail. Great. Um, so thank you, Sala. One quick last thing before we dig in. I want to acknowledge all the many people who were on the two DLP working groups that Sala has mentioned so far and who played a role in bringing to life what we're discussing today, even if they're not speaking in the presentation. The first group that was asked to develop law and policy workflows and a takedown policy included Mary Ayling, Lynn Grigsby, Michael Lang, me, Catherine Stein at CDL, and Melissa Stoner. And then as Sala mentioned, the work of that team surfaced some necessary next steps, including related to ethics in particular. So the DLP steering committee tasked another team to further develop those ethics local practices. The ethics team consisted of Lara Michaels, Stacey Reardon, me, Melissa Stoner, and Tim Ballmer. So we're going to be talking about the work product of both of these two groups today. We're gonna start the journey with some brief context for why we needed to address these issues and create policy for the library. Obviously, we wanna encourage robust use of the research-rich collections that we steward, steward. And one way that libraries or cultural heritage institutions can facilitate access and use of their special collections is by offering either ad hoc digitization services or developing mass digitization programs like DLP that Saul mentioned. Either approach would enable researchers to make use of the materials remotely and can help them engage in modern research techniques like text data mining. But implementing digitization services of any size or scope requires that cultural heritage institutions confront four key law and policy issues. We will be using this image from photographer Therese Bonnet as an example today to walk through those four issues or literacies. But first, I'll highlight the kinds of questions we need to answer under each area. Copyright. Before we can digitize and make available the photos from Therese Bonnet, we have to ask, are the Bonnet collection materials protected by copyright or are they in the public domain? If they are protected by copyright, is our library, or more specifically the UC Regent, the copyright holder? This can often be a very challenging question to answer given the state of historical gift agreements. Gift agreements often don't say anything about copyright or the rights are assigned in a confusing way or people purport to transfer rights they don't have, but do they actually have copyright? Um, if we aren't a copyright holder, does a relevant copyright exception like section 108 known as the library exception or section 107 known as fair use, so does a relevant copyright exception apply that would permit us to create and distribute digital copies anyway? Contract. Do provisions in gift or donor agreements into which we have entered limit the conditions under which digitization services or access can be provided? For instance, have they restricted access only to the reading room or for a certain number of years or for certain types of people, for example, registered researchers? Privacy. Do the collection items reveal information that could impinge upon the privacy rights of the subject under federal and state laws? Are there any exceptions under privacy laws that might limit those rights? And ethics. Are there social and religious customs or other circumstances, such as evidence of an imminent threat of personal or legal harm, or the risks of exploitation of people, natural or cultural resources, or indigenous knowledge, that may or should impact the digitization or use of the collection materials? Not only must institutions navigate these complex areas of law and policy, 
but also they need to make localized determinations about how to proceed when uncertainty arises such as instances in which metadata about a collection, like publication date, author death, death date, or rights ownership, is lacking from the collection files or too difficult to resolve. Having to develop expertise in these complex areas of law and policy can easily deter memory institutions from engaging in collection digitization efforts. Certainly, memory institutions would benefit from reviewing or relying on other institutions' guidance materials. Yet institutions are reticent to share their responsible access procedures given the perceived legal exposure that they fear transparency would create. Were a library to reveal what legal issues they consider and their understanding of those issues, they might find themselves vulnerable to threats by rights holders who feel that the library protocols insufficiently address their rights or concerns. This lack of library community guidance and the resulting absence of communities of practice regarding how to navigate responsible access decision making for digitization programs can impede digital scholarship. In our quest to track down good community guidance, we found two resources helpful. I want to give a shout out to UCLA, which created a copyright navigation guide in the context of a particular collection of theirs about California water history. Because those water history documents were largely all of a certain nature, and because that guide did not address other areas of law and policy, for example, contracts, privacy, and ethics, we found it was not exactly suited for the broader purposes of DLP. We are also very grateful to New York Public Library, which has a robust digitization program. We discussed our emerging approach with them, and they gave us a strong thumbs up. They were not releasing their own workflows publicly for the reasons I mentioned, so. In the absence of a lot of public information on how to navigate these concerns, we recognized an opportunity for the Berkeley Library to provide community support. We developed responsible access decision-making workflows, which we've publicly released with a Creative Commons license, to be adopted and customized by other institutions to, so, to suit local decision-making practices and policies. We're happy for these workflows to help other institutions methodolo methodologically organize their thinking about law and policy issues. And frankly, we see this as a low exposure concern for us because the real work in applying the workflows will come down to an individual institution or consortium's risk tolerance determination about how to proceed at junctures where information is lacking or cumbersome to assess. As we'll explain, all of those junctures are highlighted in yellow in the workflows. Of course, we need to develop our own local decisions for those junctures too, in consultation with council. As such, university council will treat those determinations as privileged. So that will be the one piece of all of this that we do not release publicly. Juncture determinations aside, the responsible access workflows provide a customizable and implementable framework to support special collections digitization at any scale for US memory institutions. And we're thrilled to bring them to life. We are also beginning to create extensive supporting documentation so that library staff at UC Berkeley and other, and ultimately other memory institutions can confidently apply the workflows. The documentation will explain how to answer each step or question in the workflows, what information one needs, what the terminology means, and where to look to find the answers. Now, please don't worry when you see, when you're looking at this slide, please don't worry that you are going to be the one to have to sit down with the documentation and apply the workflows yourself. While we don't have a DLP program manager yet, we do know that largely much of the work answering workflow questions will remain within scholarly communication. So we anticipate that certain information we need about the collection to answer those questions will be provided by curators, archivists, and liaisons or people proposing digitization of the co particular collection. And ultimately, we plan to start collecting that information going forward via a not yet created collection digitization proposal form, or in reports that could be created at the collection assessing and processing stages. All of that is totally TBD and not operationalized at all yet. It's also important to understand that the workflows serve a crucial second purpose as a framework through which to vet the online access determinations we make for our collection. Accompanying the workflows is our community engagement policy, which you can find on our digital collection sites about page. 
Our community engagement policy provides a transparent approach for us to address user requests to restrict, limit, or remove access to digital content, or to remediate metadata made available online through DLP. Other institutions often refer to this as a takedown policy, but ours is modeled on what New York Public Library does, which promotes more community conversations. Our community engagement policy offers an articulated process for inquiring about or requesting removal of online content or metadata, clear, consistent parameters for the library to assess the merits of such a request, and a timeframe for responding to requests. Of course, resolution of the request might take longer. And as shown here, the four principles that ground the library's approach to it addressing user requests. These four principles should now look familiar. Copyright, privacy, contracts, and ethics. That's because the community engagement policy statement of principles mirror the law and policies set forth in the responsible access workflows, such that content that passes muster for digitization and online access pursuant to the workflows will remain online, absent our receipt of additional information from the requester that leads to a different result when applying the workflow. It's these principles that ground our approach that really distinguish the UC Berkeley Library from many other institutions because they incorporate a bold stance to help account for and safeguard community interests. In developing the principles, we took direction from the handful of leading academic libraries that have adopted these kinds of principle statements, like University of Illinois and the University of Michigan. But unlike the policies at many other academic libraries, we also expressly incorporate ethical consideration. We account for the social and religious customs and other circumstances that may impact use of some of our materials in our collections. This was particularly critical on our campus and with our collections, given the breadth and depth of materials we steward regarding cultural communities who historically have been disadvantaged by Western power structures. For example, Native Americans, Japanese Americans who were interned, etc. This was an opportunity for our library to take a stance in recognizing the historical and evolving social, cultural, and political context in which the materials under our current stewardship have been created, collected, and used. And for us to begin approaching access decisions in relation to those contexts and in consultation with cultural communities where appropriate. It is our hope that these four principles and these types of community engagement policies inspire even more libraries to begin to apply them to their own research rich, rich collections. And in fact, they're already interested in doing that. We've already been approached by several major research libraries inviting our team to speak with them further so that they can explore similar policies and approaches. So we're gonna dig into the workflows now and to walk you through the first few workflows, I'm gonna turn things over now to Michael Lang our Copyright and Information Policy Specialist and Liaison to the DLP Program. Hi everyone. So to give you the briefest taste of how all of these law and policy questions work, we're gonna walk you through the workflows at a very high level using this undated photo from a collection by Therese Bonney, an American living and working in Paris around the early 20s through the 50s. This is a photo showing the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration's work in Europe. From the collection documentation, we know this photo, like others in the collection, was taken sometime between 1944 and 1946. For the sake of brevity, I'm going to use the example of this one photograph from the Bonnie collection, which is made up of thousands of photographic prints and negatives. You will hear me point out from time to time how certain decisions might vary at the collection level rather than at the item level. At the collection level, we'll be making sampling determinations, which carry a certain amount of risk calculus in themselves. Now, when I advance to the next slide and you see a complex workflow, please don't be intimidated looking at the chains of questions in detail. We're not gonna go through each step. We've included the visual of the workflows as a backdrop to highlight the kinds of questions we work through for our collections. One last caveat. You might not have spent time on the library's relatively new digital collections portal that Salwa discussed earlier. Just so you know, these digital items have not gone through these workflows. These were digitized and made available under then applicable library guidelines prior to the development of our new processes. 
So please, no need to email us with gotchas suggesting the workflows don't work. They just haven't been applied to existing digital collections yet. Next slide, please. So let's get started thinking about the workflows. We're starting with copyright, but the workflows can be applied in any order. And depending on when in the digital life cycle we encounter a collection, we may very well be starting with something like ethics rather than copyright. But for now, we'll start with copyright. In this case, we've got a photograph from the mid 1940s. And as I said in the last slide, really we'd be doing this as a collection of 1930s to 1940s photographs, which we believe based on some basic research was never published. We know who the photographer is and it was easy to find her date of death. For an unpublished work to be in the public domain, the creator would have had to have died before 1950. Bonnie died in 1978, so this photograph is still protected by copyright. Now it's true that many materials from the middle of the century are no longer protected by copyright because they lacked formalities like copyright notices, registrations, and registration renewals. But those formalities don't apply to unpublished works like this photo. Next, we've got to figure out how to move forward knowing it's protected by copyright, and that's copyright workflow slide three. Again, don't get hung up on worrying if you can answer all these workflow questions for yourself. We don't expect you to, that's why we're here. So we are developing clear documentation so that you or other institutions could answer them if you wanted to. Next slide, please. Okay, because this photo is unpublished and the creator died less than 70 years ago, meaning it's still protected by copyright. What it now comes down to is whether the UC regents own that copyright or a relevant exception applies. In this case, the Bonnie collection is straightforward. We, the UC regents, hold copyright per Bonnie's bequest. And our university librarian has something called delegated authority, which allows them to make certain copyright decisions on behalf of the regents for material to which the regents hold the copyright in our collection. But note that if the regents did not own copyright, then we'd have to assess whether some exception or limitation applies that would allow us to move forward with digitization and online access anyway. For instance, there's an exception under Section 108 of the Copyright Act that allows us to make use of non-commercially available works in their last 20 years of copyright. Unfortunately for the Bonnie unpublished photos, it's in copyright for at least another 28 years based on Bonnie's death date. So we couldn't rely on that exception. So it's a good thing that the regents do hold the copyright. Another example of an exception we consider when the regents don't hold copyright. We could also make a determination to digitize and make the work available based on the fair use exception. These are the types of decision-making junctures shown in the workflow in yellow that reflect choices that would be made for a collection. To be clear, anytime you see a yellow box on these workflows, it reflects a leaf question that will be answered at scale as a matter of policy. For instance, perhaps an institution that uses our workflows will decide to treat digitization of 75-year-old unpublished photographs as fair use because their understanding of fair use permits that. That's really up to the institution. But as I said, we're golden for copyright here. The regents hold Bonnie's copyright, so we don't need to rely on an exception. Next slide, please. So now we've cleared copyright and turned to contracts. Here we look again at our acquisition and collection files to determine whether there are any limits on reproduction or access, such as time dependencies, researcher access, et cetera, present in the gift or purchase agreement. This often involves a close reading of the agreement, sometimes in conjunction with counsel, because the language used in these agreements has changed over time. Hopefully you are also beginning to see that standardization and uniformity in gift agreement language can really support the digitization process. In this case, no worries here for Bonnie's material. There aren't any such restrictions. You can ask me anything about Bonnie's request. I think I've memorized it after reviewing her file so many times. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Tim Vollmer to talk about the next workflow. Thanks, Michael. Okay, let's turn to some privacy considerations. So privacy is handled differently than copyright, and this is because copyright is exclusively a question of federal law, whereas privacy is governed by both federal and state law, as well as some local campus policies. 
So in this initial slide on privacy, we first look at federal law and the campus policy. So federal privacy restrictions prevent disclosure of things like social security numbers, certain financial and medical information, uh, student records, and other types of protected personal information, uh, at least for a certain period of time. Uh, we don't have those concerns in these bounty photos, so that's some good news for us. However, state privacy laws protect people's reasonable expectations of privacy when there is one of the following things present. First, when there is what is called an intrusion on their seclusion. For example, an intrusion into a private space like someone's home. Second, when there is a public disclosure of private facts. This includes facts that a reasonable person would have an expectation of privacy in. And then third, when there's an instance of painting someone in a false light. This is akin to defamation. So state privacy laws also protect against commercial exploitation of someone's likeness or name. This is known as the right of publicity. But we should realize that the library is not making a commercial use of the collection by digitizing it. So we don't need to worry about that particular privacy right in our projects. Anyway, the just the main three state privacy laws is that we need to be on the lookout for things like nudity, illegal activity, or private personal information where people have an expectation of privacy that would be incredibly offensive if released. So if we look at the context of the Bonnie photos, we would ask a question like, is the fact that these children were under the care of the UN, uh, UN Relief and Rehabilitation Administration prompt them to remain private? So we've got to take a closer look at these state privacy law considerations and explore any relevant exceptions to them. And these are detailed in the next privacy workflow. So let's go to the next slide. So before we look deeper, it's helpful to know that there is some inherent risk protection built in for the library, because in order for someone to succeed on a claim for intrusion on seclusion or public disclosure or private facts, they must usually show that a reasonable person would have been seriously offended or injured. And the determination of whether a defendant's actions were reasonable is made by balancing the interests of the person affected with the actor's interest in pursuing their course of conduct. So in our case, we're talking about making the materials available for researchers. That could be a tough bar to cross for someone that believes their privacy has been violated. And also in order to sustain a claim, a person must show that they actually suffered harm, such as mental distress or embarrassment. But even setting aside those inherent risks, this part of the workflow shows that there are some critical exceptions to state privacy laws that permit many of our collections to move forward with digitization and responsible access. First of all, if the subjects depicted in the collection are not recognizable or identifiable to others, then there's no violation of privacy. So here, think about large crowd scenes or images without faces. There's also no intrusion upon seclusion for persons that are in public places. Second, if the matter is newsworthy or of legitimate public interest, there is typically no violation of privacy. That's because it would be in inconsistent with the free speech and free pr press provisions of the First Amendment of the US Constitution. These provisions are applied to state law through the 14th Amendment. This leads courts to balance a person's free to, right to keep information private with our First Amendment right to disseminate information to the public. And in achieving this balance, courts look to whether the facts we're intending to disclose are of legitimate public concern. Third, the right to privacy is an individual right that can't be transferred. This means that when someone dies, they lose their rights of privacy. Now, a person's family or estate might retain their commercial right of publicity but this differs from state to state. And since we're not digitizing our collections for commercial gain, the right of publicity is not a concern for us in digitizing the content. However, it might be a problem for someone who wants to reuse the content, but that's a different matter. Anyway, the point here is that if the subjects are deceased, privacy is no longer an issue.
And finally, if someone has released the information themselves or given any permission, such as we see in gift agreements, then they won't be able to sustain a state law privacy claim. These are very powerful checks to privacy. And you can begin to see that these limitations enable the library to do some decision making at scale. For instance, what if we can't determine a subject's death status for a collection? Can we rely on the fact that much of what we collect might meet the legal definitions of what is considered newsworthy or of public interest? This is where state privacy law intersects with the First Amendment, the right to free expression, and the ability for cultural heritage institutions to make this content available. We'd argue that most of our collections meet this exception. You can see that all of these large at scale decision making junctures are highlighted in yellow and we're working with council on the answers to them. Going back to our Bonnie example for this photo in particular, the work of the UN Relief and Rehabilitation Administration and their treatment of children depicted is newsworthy. This means that the library would be able to surmount privacy concerns, regardless of whether these children are now living or dead. But just because something isn't technically private, according to the law, doesn't necessarily mean that it should be made available online. And that's where we've got to start considering ethics. And that's the next piece of the workflow. So unlike copyright, contracts, and privacy, Ethics is a trickier issue because there are no laws here, but we've got to follow some kind of policy, whether it's norms within the field or our own local best local practices. There's nothing a particular issue about this photo, but to reiterate because we're talking about a big collection here, even though this photo might not be ethically compromised in any way, many of the Therese Bonnie's photos depict vulnerable children malnourished from war. Sometimes the children are nude, but as we know, death and newsworthiness are exceptions to privacy. So even most or all of those other collection photos can pass the privacy tests. But do we want to protect individuals and groups like exposing malnourished children, even if they are technically are not privacy concerned under the law? What we're really talking about is ethics. That is, should we have local principles about making this content available, even if there are no legal impediments to doing so? And generally speaking, our local ethics practices need to be implemented when providing unfettered access to a collection or materials. If those materials could lead to physical harm, exploitation of people, resources or knowledge or legal harm. So what does that mean and what are those local ethics practices? We needed to create a working group to further define and operationalize this aspect of the workflow. And we also needed to make sure we developed local ethics practices that accounted specifically for Native American collections. Next, Melissa Stoner is going to talk a bit about the background for that and about why as part of the digital life cycle program, we wound up preparing a separate set of local ethics practices specifically around indigenous collections. Thank you, Tim. Hi, everybody. All right, so a little bit of the background. Um, I'm going to talk about how, I'm gonna talk about a couple of things. Um, I'm gonna talk about, um, let's go back in time to 2017. And this is going to be when the California Indian Tribal Forum took place. Um, this forum was actually provided by the Berkeley administration um, for California Indian tribes to start the conversations about improving relationships and addressing the disposition, management, and use of Native American cultural heritage items on campus. And it wasn't just, um, and, and it's not just NAGPRA related. And I'm going to be kind of talking about, I'm going to be talking about NAGPRA. And for those of you that don't know, NAGPRA is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. So if you hear me use that acronym, that's what I'm referring to. Um, so once the forum had taken place, um, this was where uh, there was a report that was written and reviewed by the participants of the forum. And um, the participants are from 50 different tribes all across California. And there were some that were also out of state in, I would say, northern Nevada. 
um, and about 70 representatives or individuals from the tribes attended. Um, the forum lasted two days. Um, so it was April 13th and 14th um, when the forum had taken place. Um, also in attendance, so, well, before I really talk about who was in attendance, I just also want to say that out of the report, there was a I bought an 85 page report that was produced and the participants, the, the tribal members, the community had decided that the report would not be shared with the general public or the UC Berkeley campus community. Um, and as far as I know, they, they still have cho chosen to uh, not share it. Um, but back to who was in attendance. So uh, Jennifer O'Neill, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she is from the Confederated Tribes of Grand Saint Ron Ronde, and um, she's also a history and Native American uh, studies um, professor at the University of Oregon. And she was one of, she's also one of the authors of the protocols for Native American archival materials. And then that's what I'm gonna touch on a bit because we actually uh, refer to that um, in, in our report. Um, and kind of in looking at the different practices that we want to start to um, use or start to, yeah, start to use. So those protocols for Native American materials were endorsed by the Society of Ar uh, American Archivists in 2018. And go ahead and change the um, slide. Thank you. So from that, from that report, um, one of the recommendations was uh, the chancellor had read their tribal forum report and the chancellor had actually recommended that um, there's going to be a new climate um, on campus in regards to NAGPRA and, as, and that the vice chancellor for research, Randy Katz, he was actually going to appoint a working group. And that working group is the Native American Collections, in, it's a really long title. It's the Native American Collections and Archives Library and Museums at UC Berkeley Working Group. Um, and part of this group, we, we had a lot of really awesome members, um, a lot of awesome, like I had an awesome co-chair and the members of the group included Andrew Garrett, myself, Susan Edwards, Jeffrey Mackey Mason, Nicole Myers Lim from the California Indian Museum, Benjamin Porter, um, Elaine Tannen and Verna Bowie. And we basically met every week in September, October, and November of 2018. Um, we also conducted an environmental scan of the different institutions, um, archival library, and our museum collections policies regarding digitization and digital access, um, the different levels of ethical principles of collection management some of the institutions that we looked at were the American Philosophical Society. Um, we also looked at the protocols for Native American archival materials. Um, we talked to our contacts at the Autry Museum, the digital labs uh, at the University of Las Vegas, Nevada, University of Oregon, where Jennifer O'Neill is from. And we also looked at the different practices that are done by uh, the American Library Association and their different um, groups and committees that they have. So, um, and I would just say, side note, um, the Responsible Access Workflows and Community Engagement Policy Group also conducted a similar environmental scan, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so, after the report, one of, we came up with a number of recommendations, um, is to acknowledge Native American historical trauma, Native American historical trauma, acknowledge the different systems of information management, um, improve the campus climate for Native Americans, improve the NAGPRA climate, clarify research for Native American context, um, appoint a campus tribal liaison, which with much success is Thomas Thorma. Um, they, uh, he was just appointed. And one of the other recommendations is to improve accessibility, to digitize or not digitize in regards to Native American materials. Um, in campus archives, libraries, and museums, and also to empower Native American individuals, communities, and tribes to participate in curation. Um, and next, I'm going to pass it on to Rachel. Great, 
So for purposes of the responsible access workflows, we needed to develop local ethics practices um, that incorporated the work of, I always call it Melissa's report, and I promised during this presentation I would call it um, the Native American Collections Report. But um, we, we needed to incorporate the recommendations, and we also needed to develop um, local practices generally that um, accounted for situations where there is the possibility for harm or exploitation. We knew that whatever we developed would need to reflect local and professional values, standards, and ways to engage relevant communities in shaping what we digitize and how it's made available. And specifically to account for the particular recommendations in the Native American Collections Report. So when the DLP steering committee charged a working group to develop the local practices, we began by conducting um, an extensive review of relevant literature addressing a wide range of topics including ethical approaches to digitization in libraries and archives, definitions and treatments of harm and exploitation in law, international policy and professional literature, empathy and human rights, indigenous knowledge and sovereignty, and the European concept of the right to be forgotten. We found, just as the Native American Collections Report Group did, that the American Philosophical Society's protocols for the treatment of indigenous materials was a particularly inspiring and instructive tool um, that we use for much of the format and some of the language of the policies we develop. So based on all this, we came up with two documents, one for ethics local practices and one specifically um, ethics local practices for indigenous collections. I want to reinforce that both of these documents are in draft form, meaning they are not finalized and signed off on by relevant stakeholders or the DLP steering committee. We've presented them to the DLP steering committee for preliminary approval. And what we're doing after this presentation is getting your feedback. And we will be engaging with the community and other stakeholders about both policies. We expect this process to be completed in the fall. With that, I am going to turn things over to Stacey Reardon to talk about the theoretical underpinnings behind our ethics local practices. And after Stacey explains that, Laura Michaels will discuss the foundations for the indigenous materials local practices in particular. I want you to buckle up for the next part because Stacy is going to spare, spend a fair amount of time talking through the theory of why we made the choices we did when it comes to our proposed ethics local practices. This theoretical context is important though because we will be asking for your feedback as I mentioned on those ethics local practices and understanding these theoretical foundations will be key to any feedback you might wish to provide. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so as a first step, we reviewed a variety of ethical approaches to moral problems, such as deontological, virtue ethics, and utilitarian models. Um, each of these normative ethical frameworks places emphasis on mor moral responsibility and the agency of the individual. Moral agency assumes free will and ethics for research, or in this case, posting content online would therefore often hinge on the notion of consent. However, assuming that there was individual free will and consent in relation to digitizing collections is challenging. And I'm gonna go over a few reasons why. Next slide. First, structural power imbalances complicate the idea of choice or free will. Sometimes une unequal power structures shape the creation or collections of archival materials. Collectors and researchers may be in a greater position of power than content generators, that is, the people who actually create the content or from whom the content is collected. This is a problem for a consent-based ethics framework because underprivileged groups may lack either the knowledge of how information about them will be used or the ability to intervene in that usage. This is why, for example, the World Intellectual Property Organization has tried to develop international frameworks to protect communities, not just from having their traditional knowledge exploited, but also to protect them from overstudy and from not receiving the benefits of their research in some meaningful way. Since some of the content in our collections may not have come to us through the unfettered free choice of creators or from the people depicted in the content, an individual consent-based framework may not always be enough in determining our ethical decision. Next slide. Second, collections could be shared and used beyond scenarios creators and owners originally imagined. In our example, did the children in the photograph or even the photographer realize the image would one day be digitized and posted online? 
Did anyone anticipate, for example, that those images might be analyzed algorithmically through search engines or through text data mining research? Can we say that the children, photographers, or donors consented to these evolving uses? Again, while such questions might not represent legal problems, we might decide that there are certain scenarios in which we want to take a more nuanced ethical position. Next slide. So what should we do? Should we seek consent for digitization from all individuals who are creators or who are represented in our collections? We would suggest no. Obtaining individual consent for a mass digitization program, particularly when we already have been entrusted as responsible stewards of those materials, is not necessary, scalable, or perhaps even possible. Instead, what we need is a general approach that will help us make these decisions. In other words, a general approach that is consistent with our role as responsible stewards. Next slide. An alternative ethics framework that goes beyond consent and that takes into account unequal power relations as part of its approach might help us. Ethics of care associated with feminist ethics is premised on relationships and care as a virtue. An ethics of care would see content creators, those represented in our collections, donors, archivists, researchers, and the public as part of a complex network of relationships connected through empathy and responsibility, but also as embedded in power structures. What we choose to do as information providers will affect other people, particularly when people have less structural power, and we should care about that. Through its focus on relationships, an ethics of care approach also enables a progression from accounting for the rights and obligations of individuals to the rights and obligations of groups, which means we can talk about not just an individual in a photograph, but about where and how, for example, Japanese American internment materials should be shared online. Next slide. It's also important for us to probe what we actually mean by harm. After considering different types of harm, our working group settled on the following definitions in relation specifically to cultural objects. These definitions were derived from the guidance and the law and policy sources we consulted. When referencing objects, materials, or resources, we intend harm or exploitation to encompass economic disadvantage to the interests of a cultural community, such as unfair competition or commercial appropriation, violation of customary or national laws, or the established practices of a cultural community, or finally, the risk or looting of looting or defiling of cultural sites or resources. When referencing people, we intend harm or exploitation to encompass a deprivation or violation of, or a credible threat to a person's liberty, body, or well being. Next slide. So, what should we do about the potential for harm? We could take a do no harm approach for which any potential for harm would unilaterally stop us from posting digitized content online. However, ethical questions are rarely so straightforward, and this approach does not factor in the benefits that making such material accessible to researchers and the public might bring. For these reasons, our working group decided to approach this issue as one of balance. We ask whether the value to cultural communities, researchers, or the public outweigh the potential for harm or exploitation of people, resources, or knowledge. We then developed a set of principles for how to assess both value and potential harm. Some of the principles include things like, we will give added weight to potential value where there is a strong public interest in the material, considering factors like the content is about public figures, information is about communities, society, or political issues, content is self-authored, content is made up of government or journalistic documents, and so on. And we'll give added weight to the potential for harm where content impacts cultural communities that are historically disadvantaged by power structures, material is about the community or creator rather than by the community or creator, the community or creator had or has less ability to control the information or a takedown request was made. In the meantime, as a general preview of the direction we're heading with this principle, and to answer the specific question about the Therese Bonney work, based on how we evaluate both value and harm, the Therese Bonney photo we showed would move forward with digitization and unfettered online access. There is added researcher and public value here about social and political issues following World War II. 
We expect all or nearly, nearly all of her collection would move forward, but we need to review an appropriate sample of the collection before making that determination. I'm going to turn things over to Lara now to talk about how we need to adapt this base balancing principles for Indigenous materials. Thanks, Stacy. So if the Therese Bonnie materials were Indigenous materials, we might have made different determinations about digitization and access. That's because, as Melissa and Tim mentioned, we developed a separate set of guidelines for Indigenous collections. These also rely on a balancing principle similar to the one Stacy mentioned, but the balancing test has different presumed outcomes based on how materials are categorized, and I'm going to explain what I mean. It's first important to note that we developed the practices for digitization of and online access to indigenous materials around two underlying propositions, both of which illuminate the ethics working group's decision to create a separate document for indigenous materials, and both of which also originate in UC Berkeley's Native American Collections Report, which was referenced earlier. The first is that the University of California, as a public institution, exists in a dual trust relationship with both the people of California and with the people of indigenous nations and tribes within the state. We acknowledge that we have a particular obligation to enter into collaborative and mindful stewardship with indigenous communities. Second, we recognize the historical trauma inflicted upon the indigenous communities of California and honor their right to cultural ownership that uh, and, to their, and their right to protect themselves from the appropriation of their cultural materials without consultation and consent. The principles and processes outlined in the guidelines are intended to guide the UC Berkeley libraries in ensuring that decisions about digitization of and online access to Indigenous materials are mindful and collaborative. We have proposed a set of guidelines for categorizing Indigenous materials based on the American Philosophical Society's principles, which were recommended by the port, report Melissa profiled. In keeping with the APS principles, our local practices suggest that Indigenous materials, regardless of genre, be categorized by the library as not culturally sensitive, potentially culturally sensitive, or culturally sensitive. The definition of culture culturally sensitive materials in this context is provided in Article 2 of the guidelines and is based on the definition provided in the APS principles. The process of categorizing Indigenous materials may happen at any point in the life cycle of a collection or item, at appraisal, acquisition and accessioning, processing, access and digitization. The library may also alter the categorization for any collection of indigenous, indigenous materials at any point based on consultation with or notification by a tribe or a subject matter expert. In addition, a collection may contain parts that are categorized as culturally sensitive and parts that are categorized as not culturally sensitive. The UC Berkeley Library will make reasonable efforts to collaborate with and learn from all stakeholders in applying categorizations. Each of the categories comes with a particular presumption of access. For materials categorized as not culturally sensitive or potentially culturally sensitive, it is presumed that the value of providing on online access to cultural communities, researchers, and the public outweighs any potential for harm or exploitation. Materials that are not culturally sensitive may be digitized and made widely available online. Materials categorized as potentially culturally sensitive may be digitized and made available online, but this categorization requires further outreach and proactive communication with relevant indigenous communities regarding the categorization of these materials. For materials categorized as culturally sensitive, it is presumed that the potential for harm and exploitation outweighs any value that might exist in allowing online access to the materials. These materials will not be made widely available online, though they may be digitized for preservation purposes and for more restricted electronic access. The guidelines also make room for the library to enter into agreements with particular tribes, setting forth the terms and conditions of access, to ask researchers to accept certain conditions for ethical viewing and use of indigenous materials, and to utilize collection metadata to adequately contextualize indigenous materials in our collections, and to acknowledge explicitly the role of indigenous communities in the creation and co-creation of collection materials. I'm going to turn it back over to Rachel now to talk over our next steps with all of this. Okay, everyone. We know that was a lot to take in for the first time. It was also a lot for us to develop all these workflows and ethics practices. But good news, there's still more. We've got a lot of work ahead of us to fully implement these workflows. First of all, the ethics local practices. 
both sets of documents, the general set and the indigenous collection materials, as I mentioned, are in draft form. We're giving this webinar today as part of the process of engaging with various stakeholders to solicit feedback. So you'll receive a link to the, the form to give us feedback um, after this presentation. You'll have until the end of August specifically to let us know um, any suggested changes to the two draft ethics documents. Next, documentation for implementation. Um, our SPALCOM office is working on guidance for how to answer each step or question in the workflows. Everything is going to be released publicly except for the answers to our local decision-making junctures, those boxes in yellow, as we've mentioned previously. Third, we need a record-keeping protocol to link the workflow answers to item or, cat or collection metadata. When we're working with a collection, considering it for digitization, our answers to the workflow questions and the ultimate determinations about digitization and online access that flow from them need to be captured in something in order to feed the metadata at an item or collection level. Right now, we're just developing embedded logic spreadsheets for this purpose, but ideally, eventually, we'd get a grant to have developed open source software for reporting the information and linking it to the catalog metadata. Having a record of our answers to the questions will also help us with answering takedown requests and serve as important indications of our due diligence. Fourth, assignment of right statements. It's important to note that the workflows guide whether or not we can digitize and provide access, but they do not inherently assign rights or usage statements to the materials. The answers to the workflows can be used to help assign rights and usage statements, but it's going to be a whole separate endeavor and working group that DLP will task um, to begin addressing the assignment of rights statements. That work hasn't started yet. We've got our hands full. Fifth, integrating the workflows at earlier stages of acquisition, accessioning, and cataloging. Much of the information needed for the workflows can be collected and documented earlier in the digital life cycle. So there are many broader conversations to be had. And lastly, we do hope that cultural heritage institutions like ours can begin using these processes to have their own conversations about digitization and feel more empowered to move forward knowing that the law and policy questions are manageable. And we're already starting to see that's true. We've met with a handful of universities who are looking to adopt similar approaches. So there's a lot of exciting work on the horizon, a lot of exciting collaborative work on the horizon as well. Okay, I am going to stop sharing the screen now and turn things over to Sawa um, to facilitate any questions that come through in chat or that you might have for any of us. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. And I am clapping virtually. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in chat. We've had three questions that have come in, two have been answered, one hasn't. But I'd like to repeat them for um, the sake of all the members who are present here right now. 